join us. We have a couple of announcements that I will pull up on my phone. I apologize I'm getting the groove here. Um, Jen is on vacation and I was supposed to print out the announcements. So if you need announcements um, that were printed out, please see me after worship and I'll make sure that you get a copy. We have um, a special announcement from the governing board and a surprise visitor. Jim? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Is that good? Turn your mic on. It's on. No. Oh, is that better? Is that better? I want to introduce my friend Himes. These are my little friends here. Uh, we have ketchup to pass out to everyone, so Heinz is going to help pass out the ketchup. Uh, and this is to remind you of Ketchup Sunday next Sunday. Uh, if you're like me, if I only take one packet, I'm going to wonder when I get home. I have this packet of ketchup over. So I'm probably going to take two. Uh, but if you'd like to take a packet of ketchup as they pass it through, uh, kind of like the offering, except like the reverse. The offering, yes. So go ahead. So Ketchup Sunday, for those of you who might not remember or know, is that some of us, like myself, are a little behind in giving, so next Sunday is I'm going to try and catch up. And if any of you are in the same boat, I encourage you to try and catch up if you can. If you're already caught up, no need to do anything. Just sit back and enjoy the ketchup, and uh, maybe uh, Heinz will bring a hot dog or two next week. <laughs> So that's what Catch Up Sunday is all about. It's to be a fun thing. We're just asking you to do what you can to catch up if you're able. And if you're where you need to be, that's great. We appreciate your support. Thank you so much from the Governing Board. Catch Up Sunday next Sunday. Back by, by where the announcement emails should have been printed out is also the bulletins and the um, hymnal. If you didn't grab one, make sure you give us a high five and one of our helpers back there will bring it to you. And we also have a sign in. If you're a visitor, we'd love to be able to keep in touch with you. So on your way out, if you would make sure to sign in, we'd be so grateful to be able to just send you information and keep in touch. The flowers this morning are um, given by me in celebration of six years here with the church. It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that six years can go by so fast, but when you're having fun and when you're with a group of people that you love, it's just a joy. So it's just in celebration of all of you, and thank you for letting me be your pastor. Uh, we welcome Jennifer Young as our guest pianist this morning and vocalist. Thank you for being here with us. This is typically and traditionally going to be our last Sunday outside. Next Sunday we will be inside for rally day. Uh, there is some discussion on the governing board about extending our worship time through the end of September. Yes. Yes. Our warm weather has been shifting, so September and October tend to be warmer. Um, so if you're in favor of that, please let a board member know so that we can make an appropriate decision. We will always try to make sure that you have advance notice. And it, typically when Dave and I are trying to decide things, if it's not 60, what, 65 by 60, 9? 60 by 9 o'clock. Yeah, 60 by 9 o'clock, we kind of say, let's be inside. So we don't, we have no intention of freezing ourselves out here. 
but if it's lovely weather like it is today, we'd love to be out in God's nature. So let us know what you think and we'll make appropriate uh, decisions. Make sure that you come for rally day. We are gonna have a busy rally day. We are going to be doing a back to school blessing, a blessing of the backpacks. So if you're a student or a teacher returning to the classroom this year, bring your backpack or your briefcase and bring it up to the front and we will bless them and we will pray for a special blessing for all of our schools. What else are we gonna do on rally day? I forgot. Oh, we're gonna have an ice cream social after worship. So we're gonna have lots of fun and are we gonna do that in the fellowship hall, do you know? So we'll do it in the fellowship hall. It'll be lovely and fun and just a great way to kick off the school year, but also the church calendar year. We hope that you can come and bring all of your kiddos that might be interested in uh, sharing in some ice cream and some blessings. Did I miss any other announcements I need to do? The, this is the first Sunday of the month, so we collect donations for the food shelf on the first Sunday of the month. If you'd like to do that on your regular offering, just make sure you write it on your check or on your envelope as to where, what you want to go to the general fund and what you want to go to the food shelf and the treasurer. We'll make sure it gets where it needs to go. I'm glad I looked at my email. This Tuesday is the community meal. It's a drive through meal. So you drive through from five to six in the church parking lot. You let them know how many meals you need. And then you go home and you have a fantastic meal prepared for you by people of the church here. It's going to be Tuscan chicken over pasta, squash and zucchini bake, garlic bread, and dessert. It's always a wonderful meal. I hope that you can come enjoy the meal. And if you are able, I hope that you can come help prepare the meal. They start around two o'clock. They always need helpers, even if you can only help for an hour here or there. There's help to be done to prepare the meal and then to package the meal and then to deliver the meal and clean up afterwards. So all help is greatly appreciated. And then in terms of calendar, um, the worship and tech team are going to be meeting this Thursday at 6.30 on Zoom. I think that'll do us. Make sure you pay attention to the emails because things are starting back up. Chancel Choir, you've got some announcements that are coming and you should have gotten an email from the director. If you'd like to be involved in the choir, let me know and we'll make sure that you get the email so you know when to be where and when we can hear your lovely voices. Did I miss any announcements? Let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord our God. Please join me in the core worship. Sing a song of thanksgiving. Declare God's wondrous deeds. For the Lord dwells among the people. The glory of God abides with us. If you're comfortable doing so, I invite you to stand as we sing our first hymn, number four, Count Your Blessings. <laughs>
called to confession, trusting in the power of God to save us. Hey, let us confess our sins before God in this assembly. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy, Holy God, God, we, we confess, confess that our love for you and for others has not been genuine. We have not held fast to what is good, and we have lagged in affection for our brothers and sisters. We have not been patient in suffering, nor have we persevered in prayer. We have repaid evil for evil, and have failed to live peaceably with all. Forgive us our sins, free us from fear of our evil, and help us trust in the power of your everlasting goodness. Christ. Amen. Assurance of blessing. Friends, hear the good news. Christ has broken the power of sin and evil and has opened to us the way of eternal life. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. to invite the children forward for a moment. We're going to be right around this table so you guys can join me right here. We can talk about stuff here. And it's okay, you can have your back to the church if you want. We'll hold things up that they need to see. Okay, so we're going to talk about this one verse and we're going to do a vocabulary lesson for today, honestly, <laughs> because I think we might all need it. At least I know I did. So the verse is from Matthew 11, verse 29 and 30. It says, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy 
and my burden is light. Do you guys know what a yoke is? It's not a yoke of an egg. No, it's not a yoke of an egg. You're right. It sounds a lot alike, but it's spelled differently. So that was a very, very good guess. Does anybody else want to guess? This is a yoke. Oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, so uh, it can go on oxes. It can go on oxes, right? And they, what do they do with it? Or horses might wear a yoke, or? Yeah, they um, go around your neck so you can hook them up to a trailer. Right, so they might, it might hook up to a trailer like that. So they could pull a plow, or horses can pull a carriage. So yokes are something that kind of help the work become easier. Or, can I see the word? Yeah, go ahead. Or instead of this, they might just be like one. A single yoke, right? Yeah. Like that. Yeah, something like that. So you see how that yoke works? It fits around her neck, and then she can hold a basket on each side, probably water buckets maybe. So, so that's a single yoke. This. So that's a yoke, and Jesus is saying, what does Jesus say again? Let's remember. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So if you had to guess, which kind of yoke do you think <coughs> Jesus is asking you to share with him when we're doing the work? Yeah, how come? Because it's two. Because it's two instead of one, right? So, as a team. so Jesus might be asking us to work as a team rather than working all by ourselves. Why would it be important for us to work as a team instead of by ourselves? What's the danger of, of just being the only one carrying all of the burden? Uh, hurting yourself. What's that? Yeah, you might hurt yourself. Do you think it would get heavy? Yeah. As those water buckets, if you have to carry a lot of water or a lot of um, grain in there, if you do that a lot, you might get tired making all those trips all by yourself, right? <laughs> But if you're doing a double yoke like that, if you're pulling with somebody, if you get a little bit tired, somebody else is pulling with you. So you're having to use half of the energy, but you guys are getting more work done than you could do all by yourself. So Jesus is asking us to share things that are hard and heavy, things that are difficult. Well, so this is an image that we use a lot in the church we don't talk about it a whole lot, but um, this, you guys know what this is called? No. It's a stole. It's a stole. I wear stole on communion Sundays especially, but inside I wear them every Sunday. But actually what it's supposed to remind me of as your pastor is the yoke that I share with Jesus. That when I put this on, I'm supposed to remember that I am working with Christ and that I'm not working on my own efforts, but that I'm working with God. So I'm not doing this all by myself. And if you guys think well of me, that's nice, but it's not just my efforts that, that's working. It's God working through us, through us together as a body of Christ that's really doing it. So it's not that I'm super special. It's that we're working as a team with God. So I wanted to share with you, these are all of the stools that I have. And we won't talk about all of them, but I wanted to share some of them. This one was my very first stole. And it was given to me by my husband and my parents when I graduated seminary. And so when I wear this, it reminds me that there were people that believed in me and told me that I could do God's work, even if I wasn't sure I could. They did. When do you think we might see this stole? What's in the pictures? Can you see? There's a stole star. There's a shepherd. Yeah. Who's oh, that? Baby Jesus. Baby Jesus. So when might we wear this stole uh, then? Christmas for the uh, birth of Christ. Christmas for the birth of Christ. So I wear this during Advent when we're getting ready for Christmas and for Christmas itself. Christmas of peace. Yeah, peace, hope, love. Every Sunday has a theme, so those words are on there. Very good. This one is purple. So there's certain seasons of the year that are purple. Advent is purple, or Lent is purple, or Lent is the season right before Easter. Have you guys seen me wear this stole? Do you remember when we might wear it? Christmas. Christmas. And when else? I wear it at Pentecost. 
because red is the color of the Holy Spirit, and we celebrate the birth of the church and the arrival of the Holy Spirit with us. So I wear it usually on Confirmation Sunday and Pentecost, but special days. And you know it's special. Anytime there's a color of gold in the church, you know it's a special day. It's a really holy day. Okay, Nate, show me what you got over there. This one. This got lots of colors on it, huh? What do you see on this soul? Strings. Strings, yeah, different strings and different colors. So this was from my very first church um, on the anniversary of my first year being with them. They all tied a ribbon on there and told a memory of me. And so, and then at my second church, right before I left, they did the same thing. They all tied a ribbon on there. So a lot of times you'll see me wear this on communion Sundays. And I pray for the whole church here individually while we have communion. But I also remember the other people that are having communion that day that I'm not with today, but that I still love. This one. What colors do you see in this one? You see gold. So what does that tell us? Easter. Easter. Yeah. It's a high holy day. And it's kind of got pastel colors and everything. And this one's really special to me because a mentor and a family member gave this to me. Actually, she gave the fabric to me and she asked my mom to make the stole. So my mom made the stole and it's fabric from <clears throat> one of her son's trips to Spain. And so I remember the people that are with me at communion. And this is our last one that we'll think about. So this one, what do you see on this? This one's a fun one. Yeah, you see fish and a river. And then, do you guys see what this is? What's that? Black, and then it looks like, those are upside down, try these ones. Like a comma? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a comma, that's the symbol of the UCC church. And you guys, this church, gave this stole to me when I was installed here as your pastor. And so when I wear this stole, I remember the job that I have here and the trust that you put in me to be your pastor and to help lead us. Now there are other professions that wear symbols of their industry or that have things that might remind them of their work. So what would a doctor wear that would be part of their work that might be maybe a yoke? that would remind them that they work with God. A lanyard. A lanyard, yeah. They always usually wear a lanyard, which is how they log into their computer systems usually. What do they, they use a stethoscope to listen to your heart? Yeah. So sometimes they wear that around their neck. Oh, it's what I'm going to say. That's all right. It's a big word to remember. Or sometimes there's people that work in surgery, so they might wear scrubs. So they might wear a particular uniform. And every time they put that on, that reminds them of the work that they're going to do. What about, um, let's see, who else could we think that would have different jobs? What about a construction worker? What would they wear? A hard hat, right? To protect themselves. A vest. A vest, yeah. What about a firefighter? They would probably wear a hard hat and a, an outfit, right? Special one that's yeah. supposed to protect them. A mask. What about a teacher? What would they have? A pencil. A pencil and paper, maybe? Or lots of us, lots of us require computers to, our, to do our jobs anymore. So we might have a computer that would remind us. And so whatever your jobs are this week, I hope that when you use that thing that you use often in your work, whether it's a pencil, a paper, a briefcase, a computer, a phone, that you would remember that you're not called to work just for yourself, but that you're called to work with God. And that God makes the work easier because God's walking with us. God also walks with us when we are having a tough time with our emotions. So God helps us with our work, but God helps us with our emotions too. So this week, I want you to look for the yokes that you see people wearing for their jobs. And every time you see it, I want you to say, thank you God for this doctor for this nurse, for this teacher, for this bus driver, anybody that you see doing their job, I want you to just say in your heart, thank you, God, for this person. I work for a bus driver. Okay. He's for a bus. He's for a bus. You're right. That would be. All right, are you ready to pray? 
Holy God, Holy God. Help, us to share help us to share our burdens with you, our with you. And, to and to yoke ourselves to you. Thank you for making the way easier. Amen. Thank you so much. Good job. We're off lectionary this week, which um, <clears throat> made it a, a little bit harder, in fact, to plan for this service. But it's been something that's been weighing on my heart for a long time that I thought Labor Day weekend is a good weekend to talk about. So we're going to talk about work and, and the theology of work. And so the scriptures kind of encapsulate that a little bit. The first one is from Deuteronomy 15, verses 7 to 11. If there is anyone among you, if there is among you anyone in need, a member of your community in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand, willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. Be careful that you do not entertain a mean thought, thinking the seventh year, the year of remission is near and therefore view your needy neighbor with hostility and give nothing. Your neighbor might cry to the Lord against you and you would incur guilt. Give liberally and be un ungrudging when you do so. For on this account, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. Since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. Our second scripture is Psalm 127, and it talks a little bit. You can hear the echoes of uh, yoking ourselves with God in our work. It's God's blessings in the home. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives sleep to his beloved. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Our gospel lesson is from gospel, Matthew chapter 11, verses 26 to 30. This is Jesus speaking. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And lastly, just one verse from Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. Providing God, by your Holy Spirit, feed us with your word, that we might be filled with the bread of life. Amen. All right, so the, the question that really started me off on this whole journey was, why do we work in the first place? Today, I, I want to talk to you about work and what work looks like for the faithful. And it, it really has been weighing on me for lots of reasons. I know there are young adults in our church who are beginning their careers and are discerning what is to be their work in the world. And I've begun wondering, why, why work? Why do we work? If we strip away the economics of it, the desire to get ahead, if we strip away the need for survival, what is it that motivates us to work? And honestly, you fellows out here that are retired, have really 
help me answer this question a lot because if you don't need to work, what drives you, what motivates you? What work do you pursue then when you don't need to work? In my experience, there is a kind of satisfaction that comes from hard work. It's the satisfaction of creating something or working with a team. Work builds trust among teams when you work together. It builds muscle and endurance when you're doing something physical or it builds the muscle and endurance of trust and teamwork and collaboration if your work is more mental. But we cannot fully discuss the theology of work without also discussing the importance of rest and of Sabbath. There's a bit of an irony, isn't there, to be here on the Sabbath day talking about work? And when I went researching on my shelf, there are very few books about the theology of work, but there's plenty of books on the theology of Sabbath and on resting. We know why we rest, it's because we need it, because we are in a society that is tired, that is maybe even close to exhausted on a regular basis. And I don't know if looking at Sabbath is going to answer the solutions, to, it's gonna give us the solution to our exhaustion. I think sometimes we need to look at the work itself and ask ourselves, are we going about that in a way that we could adjust some so that we aren't continually exhausted? <clears throat> so I did find two books that talked about work, just in specific chapters. <clears throat> Joan Chittister is a sister in the Order of St. Benedict, and she wrote a book called For Everything a Season. She walks through the, book, the famous chapter from Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season and a purpose to everything under earth. And then Barbara Brown Taylor wrote uh, The Seeds of Heaven. They're her sermons on the Gospel of Matthew. And so she wrote one chapter on the uh, passage that we wrote from, read from Matthew about taking God's yoke upon ourselves. An easy yoke is still a life of work. So why does Jesus say that it will give us rest? Why does Jesus say, come take my yoke, for my burden is light and easy? Jesus promises rest, even in the work. That seems strange a little bit, that the work would be easy. In Protestant Christianity, there is a tension, and it becomes an obstacle, really, to talking about Sabbath and work. There's a tension between works and grace, and it starts in the Bible. Paul um, talks about putting our faith into action, working, doing deeds of faith. James um, says faith without works is dead. But there's a danger to that line of thought, because if we constantly focus on the works of our faith, we start feeling a little proud of our work. We start thinking that we can earn our way into heaven. And then the worst part of that is if we've earned our way into heaven, then there's some people who just don't care enough to work their way into heaven, haven't tried hard enough to work their way into heaven. Martin Luther calls out James, and I think the, 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 the book of James is really a fantastic book, but Martin Luther calls out James and calls it a gospel of straw. He's very condemning of that. And he says, he reminds us that uh, we cannot work our way into heaven, that it is grace alone that is our salvation, that work comes out of our faith, but it doesn't save us. It's not our salvation. Grace is our salvation. And in our workaholic culture, our faith pushes against the culture to say nothing we do or don't do can separate us from God's love. That's what our faith says. The laws of economics, the laws of the world would say that we do good things and that proves that we're right, that we're good people. But it's the opposite. It's our faith comes out of who we are. It doesn't prove anything. It doesn't earn us any prizes. Faith demands that we live as changed individuals, that we live as though the gospel 
is life altering because it is. This morning's reading contains one of the greatest consolation passages of all time. Come to me, all who let you, all who labor and are heavy laden, Jesus says, and I will give you rest. It is a promise that offers hope, a hope of health, hope of a God who will lift the sweaty loads off our backs and replace them with a lighter yoke. Lighter because it yokes us with one who is greater than we are and with those whose strong help we can bear any burden. Barbara Brown Taylor reminds us that often we feel like we have a single yoke, that we're doing all the work ourselves, that we have to, and that if we want it to be done right, we have to do it ourselves. When Jesus is asking us to share the load, Jesus is asking us to use a devil yoke with us so that when the way gets rough or the load gets too heavy, when we stumble and would fall, the person that we are yoked with, the God that we are yoked with, will help us stand up, will help carry some of that weight until we're able to carry it again ourselves with God's help. We have a savior who offers us respite from the heaviness of the world. But what does this mean for the work of the church? Because I, I listened to a lot, an embarrassing number of podcasts about the theology of work and what it means. And almost every single one of them was about how to be a person of faith in your workplace how to take your faith to work with you, or how your faith helps you to get ahead almost, is really the bottom line of some of those podcasts. But there's a reason that we work. And what is that in the first place? Why do we work? And I think it really goes back to creation, that sometimes work feels like a burden because of sin, because of the punishment that was given to Adam after the original sin. That you're, that you're going to toil and the work is going to be hard. But let's be honest, there would have been work anyway in the garden. Gardens do not maintain themselves without help. And so I have to think that there would have been joy in the work in the garden as well. So work is not always this terrible punishment. Sometimes it's something that we do for the sake of the world. Joan Chittister, um, one of the podcasts that I listened to that was quite helpful was Ruth Haley Barton. She writes the book, Sacred Rhythms, and she's written several books about Sabbath as well. And in the podcast that I listened to her talk about Sabbath, she makes the point that Sabbath is a communal practice, that Sabbath is not something that we observe just to renew ourselves. All of us experience it. We've all said, I come to worship every Sunday because I feel better going into my week. I feel more grounded. I feel more centered. But if we're honest, it's also something that we do as a community. We have set this time aside together to rest, to sing, to pray, to think about God's call on our lives. We, none of us, could do church without each other. So Sabbath is a communal practice. I think work is a communal practice as well. We work to benefit others. We work to benefit our community. We work to benefit our family. We do work because it's something that we feel proud of putting out into the world. None of us would work if we didn't think what we were doing was good work. In Joan Chittister's book, For Everything is Season, she um, writes about a time to build up, and I love how she talks about it because she says that um, a time to build up is the dailiness of now, the demands work, not of dreamers, but of doers. And she says of those rebuilders, it's easier said than done. Ask Noah, navigating an ark through a storm is hardly a challenge. People know a storm when they see one. They flee it blindly, whenever, whatever way they must, however frightening the manner of retreat. Chaos knows no fear, no reason. 
what people will not do, think of doing in ordinary time, they do without thinking in difficult times. After all, arcs float. Cramped quarters are better than no quarters at all. Sacrifice abounds at a time of social upheaval. Any amount of effort, all manner of endurance is possible. Nothing is too much to ask of people for whom the good life has become more rumor than fact. But that kind of character outlives itself quickly, exhausts itself post haste when the gust turns and the pressure falls. Then there is a condition worse than suffering, and that is peace. No storm lasts forever. Sooner or later, every wind passes. Then the time comes to start over, to do better than before, to produce an alternative product, a finer idea, a truer system, a preferable institution, a gentler nation than the one that preceded this one. It's a time of new creation, a leap of e into eternal darkness, a moment of truth. She names something that I think our culture desperately needs to hear, that we've made it through storms, lots of storms, physical storms in this past two weeks, but even storms of social upheaval in our culture. And now we're in the time after the storm, which she says is much harder. And I have to agree because there's a very specific focus to surviving a storm or a time of upheaval. But in that time of rebuilding, you have to find a focus, a vision, a purpose for your work. And she points out it later in the chapter, the problem with that is we're products of the last system, that, that we were part of the problem in the last system. We were part of why God sent the flood in the first place, and yet we're trying to build something new. So how do we rebuild? We have weathered several such storms in the last 10 years as a church. We put our heads down, we did what needed to be done in order to make it through the storm and to keep each other in the boat. We showed mutual forbearance when there were differences of opinions. We patiently waited for dry land to appear. Now, I don't know if you can feel it, but I can feel it. Now we are building some momentum there's some excitement about where we're going as a church. We're getting our wheels under us, which primes us to do some really exciting and fun work together for God and for our beloved community here. This is why I think we need to think about work and rest and the importance of both. We must remember the need for thoughtful, faith-filled work, coupled with mindful, deliberate rest. If we charge ahead without that balance, we will not be building what is God's, but what is our own heart's desire. Work and rest in balance help us remember that we are working with God, not by ourselves. So take heart and have courage. Sorry, I forgot. There's one more thing that Joan Chittister said that I wanted to remind us of here. She has some warning for the rebuilders that we are part of the, la the, the, we were part of the problem before in rebuilding. To be a rebuilder means to risk failure time and time again, it means to risk the support of the crowd that you set out to save. It means to be left in the dust as a crazy eyed charlatan or a starry eyed visionary, both useless, both dangerous. To the rebuilder, Life is one long spiritual exercise in co-creation. Sanctification de depends for them on doing, always doing, whatever is necessary to prod the world one step closer to the reign of God, one idea nearer to the vision of God, one moment closer to the will of God. Rebuilders are the artists of the soul who shape a piece of human creation and then leave the results to the kiln of time. We may not see the results of our work. They do not claim to have all the answers. Instead, they claim to honor the questions. They are prepared to float forever if necessary, to find a better world, to shape a finer piece of the planet. 
Rebuilding takes time and it takes hard work, but it's such worthy work and satisfying work, and it will take all of us. George Bernard Shaw says, uh, as about work, he says, I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it what I can. God has never once asked us to save the world by ourselves. Rather, God asked us only to belong to God, to share in God's work. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle in heart and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. As we come to the table today, and as we share communion in remembrance of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, may we know how valuable each and every one of us is at that table, and how much our work contributes to God's work in the world. Let us pray. Holy God, you have asked us to be anointed for your work. You have told us that we are the salt of the earth, that we bring light to the world. You have said to each of us that we are not too young or too old, we're not too rich or too needy to bring good news to the impoverished, to give a hand to the brokenhearted, to live out freedom and pardon through the gifts you have given. So help us to remember, Lord, to pack peace into our toolbox, hope into our briefcase, and love into our lunchbox, and may integrity, honesty, and joy be our designer wear of choice as we go about your work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of response, number 69, Jesus, the very thought of thee. concerns that we would lift up together today. I would ask for prayers for my father-in-law Lynn as he waits for test results. Continued prayers for my brother Carl. He is stabilized enough to be moved to long-term care. 
So um, let's have that be an easy process for him. And another prayer request, Madison is homeless. Um, James has been able to get his life together. I want to say another word, but um, he has his license, driver's license back. He's been able to get a vehicle, so they're living out of that vehicle. It's a small SUV, and it's currently having issues with the coolant system, so they're headed back here to Akron, Ohio to fix the car in his father's shop. So prayers of whatever those two need. I mean, Milo, what's one positive out of it is I'm getting a lot of good pictures of Milo because you know that makes him feel better. <laughs> uh, but, you know, for their life situation to improve. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Praise the bell. Over here with Judy. I would just like prayers for the family in Uniontown that passed away last week, um, for their parents, grandparents, the friends, and the whole community, really. Thank you. Um, I have a prayer request for my uh, son, Adam. He took a really big step yesterday. Uh, after about 11 and a half years um, at the Wit Thinking Lizard, uh, he decided to leave. Uh, he's worked 60 to 80 hours a week for about the last five years at the expense of his health and um, time with his daughter. Um, so he's deciding to make a change. We don't know what that change is yet, but I could not be more proud of what he's done in those 11 and a half years. He started off as a dishwasher part-time and over the years became the top kitchen manager in the entire chain. He's uh, grown professionally and personally and I could not be more proud of him. But prayers as he makes this um, shifting gears in his life right now that he lands on his feet soon and um, he's blessed for the amount of time he's going to be able to spend with his daughter. I'd just like to uh, offer some, ask for prayers for my uh, uncle Jerome. Had some surgery. We don't know uh, the extent of his uh, cancer, but he has cancer, and uh, just prayers for him. We don't know for another week or so. And also, I talk offer prayers for the folks who are at Burning Man. My son Alex is there. He's 23 and. Um, I just checked AP. There was actually a death there. I thought that it was him. There are many thousands of people there, and they're prepared to survive. But uh, unexpected weather came in, and they're they're all stranded. Uh, in yeah, the yeah. They, they closed off access to the park. So um, prayers for the um, attendees at Burning Man that they are able to stay safe. Morning passed away yesterday morning, so I asked for prayers for the family. Uh, what was that first name? Glenn. Glenn. Okay. Thanks, Judy. Uh, I'm asking prayers for the family of my previous boss who retired about two years ago. She just passed away this past weekend. So. Carol, right? Um, no, no. This was her name was Diane. Diane. Prayers about Thanks, sir. I won't name everyone. I will very likely name the family members that have been lost and, and death that have been experienced. But I will also offer prayer time for silent prayers to be lifted up. Let's be a people of prayer. Holy God, we pray for those who are hungry, for those who struggle each week to pay their bills, for those who are homeless. We pray for the sick and the lonely. We pray for those who cry out for dignity. 
those uh, oppressed by unjust wages, those who bear the yoke of prejudice. We pray for those whose basic needs are denied. And Lord, we pray for those who will not feed the hungry, for the wealthy who do not care. We pray for those who deny shelter to those that need help. We pray for those who are unable to give comfort or who will not listen. We pray for those who exploit unjust systems and people who use discrimination for their betterment. God, you have commanded us to work in order to meet our needs. We ask that you would bless our work and that you would bless our communities through our work. Help us to be aware that our efforts are only beneficial when we ask for your help with them, that we do not carry the weight of the world, but that we do your work with your help. We pray that you would be with all of those that we have lifted up today, those who are struggling with health and waiting for test results, those who are struggling with their life circumstances or changing their life circumstances for a better quality of life. We pray for those under the burden of cancer. And we pray for those people who were going for recreation but now are facing dangerous situations. And Lord, we pray for all the people who have lived through storms and are literally picking up the pieces of their lives. Especially, Lord, we pray that you would be with those who have lost loved ones. We pray for the family in Uniontown that all died this past week. We pray for their parents and their friends and the community that reels in the shock of that event. We pray that you would be with them and comfort them, that you would help us to find some measure of peace in a world of violence. We pray for the family of Glenn who passed away this last week. And we pray for the family of Diane, Sarah's former boss, who passed away this week. Lord, we thank you for the gift of people, the gift of sharing time with loved ones. And we thank you for the appreciation that time is so short and for the promise of everlasting life. We pray that you would continue to be with those who grieve and who struggle with their losses. Above all, Lord, may we continue to walk with you under your yoke, knowing that your way is easy and that you give us rest. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we bring our morning's offering, let us give as God has abundantly given to us.
God, receive these gifts that we offer with grateful hearts and use us for your ministry in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Will you join with me in the invitation to the table? Beloved in Christ, the gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus was raised from the death and appeared to Mary Magdalene. On that same day, sat at table with two disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Men and women, youth and children, come from the east and west, from the north and the south, and gather about Christ's table. This is the Lord's table. This is table is for all who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. Here at Southfield UCC, we practice an open table. All are welcome at this table. We serve gluten-free bread and grape juice. After the communion prayer and the breaking of the bread, we'll pass the bread and the juice. And I invite you to hold each individually so that we may take them together as the body of Christ. Will you join with me in the invitation? The spirit of creation is with you. And the spirit of creation walks next to you. Open wide your souls. We open them to the creator's love. Let us give thanks to the God of earth and rain. With joyous voices, hearts, and hands, we exclaim to God our praise. Let us pray. We delight with our holy God on this earth, and we rejoice forever in what God has created, is creating, and will be created. The spirit of creation built this vast universe, including our beautiful, strong, and fragile planet. The earth held the plants and animals in the Garden of Eden. Later, the earth carried the Israelites on their wilderness journey, and while they danced joyously in the promised land, the earth absorbed the tears of Job, supported the steps of the prophesying Elijah, and carried David in the shadow-filled valleys. Jesus taught on mountains and plains, walked through the land healing the aching, and prayed in gardens late at night. In times of exile and times of return, the land held stories of our ancestors in faith. Today, we abide on this earth, in houses of worship, in homes and in halls. We know this land we share today is sacred. It bears much fruit. It holds the flora of friendships and deep within its cells are the stories of its ancestors, parents, guardians, and leaders of the faith. We know their footprints are still felt by the earth. And we remember the ones who held this land as their own centuries ago. They were the first to tend to the land to nurture it as a parent would nurture their child. The winds of occupation seared the land and crushed the hearts and lives of its first inhabitants. Through the hydrating tears of God, the land remembered its strength from its ancestors. In our spaces today, we remember their place on the land and their care for creation. From the strength of those who have gone before comes the seeds of gra for grains and grapes. The land has given birth to the fruits of our sacrament. With glory to our God, we praise the spirit of creation. Holy, 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 spirit of earth, air, fire, and water. Heaven and earth delights in your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who brings love and life to our world. Hosanna to our God. Hallelujah. On the night before Jesus walked the ground, carrying the tree to Golgotha, he gathered with faithful friends. From the grain in the ground came the bread that Jesus took and broke in his hand, and he blessed the bread, and he said to his friends, this is my body, broken for you. When you eat this bread, remember me. And then after supper, Jesus took a cup filled with the fruit of the vine, knowing they were all connected like the vine and the branches. Jesus said to them, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As you drink from the cup, remember me. Spirit of God, just as you hovered over creation and renewed your church at Pentecost, surround these elements, encircle us, energize our souls, and connect us with each living being here on earth. Just as you have delighted in humans since creation, 
May your presence create joy in our spirits, transforming us into new beings. Bless the soil that birthed the grains and grapes that we share today. May these elements be transformed into a meal that connects us all. Like the lion and the ox, like the lamb and the wolf, we eat together, whether near or far, whether well or ill, whether marginalized or privileged. May this meal be one in which we embrace the power we have and strengthen the world with justice and peace, kindness and love. Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. body of Christ broken for you.
blood of Christ shed for us all. <coughs> Will you join with me please in our prayer of thanksgiving? Let us pray. Holy God, divine designer, with gentle compassion, you unite us as vine and branches, whether near or far. For your meal, we share our gratitude. With thanksgiving, we voice our joy for our siblings in faith who shared the table with Christ and with us. Our souls are rejuvenated with your holy refreshment. Send us into the world today with joy in our hearts, excited to proclaim your radical love in this world. Amen. If you're comfortable doing so, I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, number 43, Come Thou Almighty King. <coughs> to join in our fellowship circle which encircles the pavilion we will uh, hold hands and say the lord's prayer after counting off for attendance and then we will close with the choral benediction and the charge of blessing <laughs> Just 
just um, food for thought as you go into the circle here, just in case you think that uh, working in faith is something that you only do at a younger age, that it, I want you to encourage you that it can actually happen at any age. There's no retirement in uh, Christian circles, uh, so we all are part of that. But So as part of that, I wanted to bring you news from the CAT team that uh, has been formed within the church. There's been a rumor for some time that I'm not a cat fan. And um, despite my allergy to cats, I do in fact love them dearly. And so I've been following news about cats for some time. And I found this story this week about a cat grandpa who, uh, he was a middle school teacher. And upon retirement, he wasn't sure what to do with his time. And so he decided that he wanted to go to the animal shelter and brush cats. But um, every time he would go to brush cats, he fell asleep uh, with the cats and just ended up napping with them. And so his call in life really has become, and the, and the shelter just loved it, because it's stress relieving for the cats to have somebody to sleep with and on. So his call in his retirement and his work in, for God is to be a cat napper. So just in case you're wondering, the, the calls of God take multiple forms, and uh, I encourage you to find creative ways to find God's call. <laughs> All right, I'll start the count off. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Christ. And may God be gracious to you. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and every day.